welcome back if you join us for the first talk of the day. And for those who are joining us now, welcome to day three of Premier Power Week. I'm Fabiana Bacchini, Executive Director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation, CPBF, and your host for this event. The Premier Power Week is the second of two international life series that CPBF is hosting 2020 in recognition of World Prematurity Day. These education sessions are in collaboration with the International Family Integrated Care Committee, the Canadian Association for New Natal Nurses, EFCNI, and GLANS, the Global Alliance for the Newborn Care. For those not familiar with CPBF, we are a charitable organization, and our mission is to support and educate Canadian families of premature babies every step of the way. We believe that through consistent information, access to helpful resources, and peer support inside and outside the NICU, we can empower families, ensuring they are ready to care for their baby. Consistent information is especially important today when we are facing a global pandemic. With educational sessions like this, we intend to bring you the guidance of healthcare professionals and the knowledge gathered by researchers around the world. These are valuable tools to help our community raise awareness and advocate for the well-being of families and their babies. I would like to thank Abvi for the unrestricted educational grant and Pampers for supporting the Premi Power Week. And right now we are going to talk about uh, the emerging trends in preterm birth rates during the pandemic lockdown. There have been two small studies that have identified that preterm birth rates fell drastically during the pandemic lockdown. Researchers from the International Perinatal Outcomes in the Pandemic, IPOP study, have gathered a large international group of scientists from, from over 20 countries to look at these trends and to identify any factors that might have caused these trends to happen. We will discuss these possibilities and invite feedback and discussion from the audience right after Dr. Mary Lee's presentation. She's joining me here now. Dr. Mary Lee Brockway is a registered nurse and an international board certified lactation consultant. She completed her PhD in nursing at the University of Calgary. She's currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Manitoba in Dr. Megan Azad's lab our previous speaker, and she's exploring clinical applications of donor human bank and leading the IPOP study. Uh, Mary Lee, thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm so honored to have you joining us from Calgary this afternoon. So I will let you, you guide us through your presentation and hopefully have a great discussion after. Thank you, Fabiana, and I'm very pleased to be here talking to everyone um, in the audience. Um, I'm kind of switching hats, um, and it's always a hard act to follow Dr. Azad, so uh, I share her passion with breast milk. But in that passion, I also um, love working with families of premature infants and have done a lot of work uh, in the NICU with breast milk feeding. Um, and I also have, have a lot of interest in preventing preterm birth because um, if we prevent preterm birth, then we don't have the babies in the NICU. And that was kind of an interesting trend, as Fabiana alluded to, that we saw um, um, an outcome of the pandemic lockdown. We noticed some trends about that. So I'm going to talk about a study where we have developed to explore those trends. Um, it's called the International Perinatal Outcomes in the Pandemic Study, or IPOP, as we fondly call it. So I just want to talk about our leadership team who we've brought together um, over the past three months. And IPOP is a relatively new study, but it has taken quite momentum uh, and gotten going very quickly. Um, so you met Dr. Megan Azad at the previous session uh, out of the University of Manitoba. Myself, Dr. David Bergner, who is a pediatrician out of Australia. Uh, Natalie Rodriguez is our project manager uh, or coordinator, and she's out of the University of Manitoba. And then we have Dr. Sarah Stock, who's an um, OBGYN out of Edinburgh, and Dr. Helga Zawega, who's a perinatal epidemiologist. So she looks at trends population-wide in perinatal health. She's co-assigned, so Australia and Iceland, so we get some nice global perspective from her. And I also want to acknowledge Fabiana, and many of her colleagues from the EFCNI have been fantastic um, champions of the IPOP study and have been working with us to provide patient engagement and their own personal perspectives 
as parents of premature infants, um, and we're really incorporating a lot of their work into our study design as well. I probably don't need to talk to you too much about this slide, but we all are aware that preterm birth uh, is a major concern uh, for families, for the healthcare system. Um, they consist of about one in 10 births internationally, uh, at, which works out to about 15 million babies every year that are born prematurely. Um, it does, it can lead to disability or long-term health outcomes. Uh, so it's something we really wanna look at preventing when possible. Many of you may be aware of some of the uh, media that came out during the pandemic that started to discuss some trends that we saw uh, related to the pandemic lockdown. And we're all familiar with the, the impact the pandemic lockdown had on our lives as far as not being able to go out. Many of us had restrictions to accessing healthcare. Uh, some of us or lots of us had to stay home from work. So we weren't leaving the house that often. And one other um, trend that was noticed in relation to these lockdowns was that some of the NICUs across the world were reporting lower censuses or that they had fewer babies in their NICUs. And people started to ask why. Um, some of you may have seen these articles. This is fairly Canadian centric, but the Globe and Mail indicated, uh, and we actually noticed this through our milk bank here in Calgary. Uh, it's a community milk bank, so it delivers milk to NICUs across Canada, and they stopped really having a lot of orders for milk. So their requests for milk went down. And when they called around to the NICUs to explore why, people were saying, well, we just don't seem to have the babies. We don't really need the milk. Uh, so they, that kind of flagged a red flag going, well, what's going on? So that was one of our first indications that things um, were slowing down at the NICUs. And then uh, this other article here by Elizabeth Preston out of the New York Times, she started to call around to researchers and contacted me asking if I knew anything about this uh, trend. And at that point, we really didn't. We had no idea. Uh, we had heard murmurings of it from clinicians across Canada and some from um, other countries, but really nobody had come together to look at that, the trends. So since then, some other articles have been released indicating that maybe it's not indeed a de decrease in preterm birth rates, but potentially an increase in stillbirth rates. So some, some studies have been released uh, that show that stillbirth rates have increased particularly or predominantly in uh, lower or middle income countries, but we have seen some trends in some uh, higher income countries as well. And uh, another element that has come out is likely that is due to a reduced access of care or women not seeking care uh, or feeling that they can seek care if something arises with their pregnancy. So we have kind of a couple of outlying questions here that, that we really were curious about. And as researchers and clinicians, we started to go, really, like what is happening here? So we started to ask, is this really happening everywhere or is it localized to certain sites? And of course, being uh, clinicians and researchers, why is this happening? Like, what is happening? What is the reason? And the other thing we wanna know is if this is affecting all pregnant women the same, or are there different reasons? Is, um, are pregnant women with other health issues being affected differently or other socioeconomic um, status being affected differently? So these were questions that really started to pique our interest. Um, and some of the studies that Fabiana uh, referred to in her introduction, uh, when we started out, there were two preprints. So these were not peer reviewed studies, which is how in science we really move forward on, on developing evidence, but they were going to be peer reviewed, were put up showing that preterm birth rates, um, well, particularly in Ireland, had dropped 73% for very low birth, very low birth weight infants. And then uh, in uh, Denmark, we saw a 90% reduction in extremely preterm infants. So those were the first two studies that really started to say, okay, we're, we're starting to see some evidence here. Um, again, I acknowledge that they weren't peer reviewed, but uh, definitely enough for us to move forward with. And then uh, shortly after, one of our collaborators, Dr. Jasper Bean, did um, quite a nice study looking at 
um, preterm birth rates in the Netherlands and showed that early in the lockdown, very during the very strict lockdown time, there was about a 15 to 23 percent reduction in preterm birth rates. Um, and then we had another study come out from a lower middle income country, Nepal, that showed that there was actually an increase in preterm birth, but more concerningly, there was quite a large increase in stillbirths. So at this point, as we were moving forward and starting to develop our study, we sat back and thought, okay, this may not just be looking at preterm birth rates. We really have to consider perinatal outcomes as a whole, stillbirth, low birth weight, and what have you, so that we really get a nice view of what's happening across the world. Some of these studies that we presented uh, they did have some limitations, and since uh, since we started, of course, there's been quite a few more studies published, and we're seeing quite inconsistent results coming out. So, um, from higher income countries, some people, some sites are located or um, reporting decreased preterm birth rates. Some are reporting increased stillbirth rates. Uh, really, from the low and middle income countries, we do see um, reports of increased stillbirth happening. And another uh, interesting factor to consider that only one study that we're aware of looked at was a medically indicated preterm birth or iatrogenic. So when um, a woman would go in for a prenatal screening and the physician would see that something was wrong and say, we need to uh, induce birth right now. So we've actually seen in some studies quite a significant decrease in those iatrogenic or medically indicated preterm births. So these are all developing the full story for us to look at as we move forward with the IAPOP study. But I did want to mention that the studies that have been published to date tend to be really from single hospitals or single sites. So they're not really population or representative of the, um, the greater country. Um, many of them did not account for stillbirths and uh, none of them are really exploring mechanisms or the reasons why we're seeing this. So uh, these are limitations from those studies and things we're going to be moving forward with in the IPOP study. And then the other thing that really is missing right now, because as I said, predominantly they're single state studies, is looking at the difference between high income and low and middle income countries. So as we sat back to discuss the IPOP study and the proposal, we started to discuss why this might be happening and why we might be seeing difference, differences in trends um, between pandemic times and non-pandemic times. We kind of came up with a, a good news, bad news kind of story. So some of the reasons we think that um, we're seeing reductions in preterm birth and there is a lot of thinking um, and evidence to support that preterm birth is often instigated by some sort of inflammation in the mom's system. And it could be any sort of inflammation. It doesn't necessarily have to be an infection. It's not something that's really well understood, but it tends to be our understanding as clinicians and scientists that inflammation can um, start or instigate preterm birth. So we were thinking about things that might reduce inflammation as a result of the pandemic lockdown. And uh, this is an issue up for debate, but maternal stress, uh, if you think of maternal physical stress from a pandemic perspective, we're not seeing moms really leaving the house to work um, late in their pregnancy. So lots of moms had to start working from home or if they had uh, labor intensive jobs, maybe they weren't actually going out and doing that work. Um, we also saw quite a significant increase in personal hygiene as far as hand washing and uh, hand sanitizing. So that in turn may have decreased infections, which is another form of inflammation. Another thought, there's quite a lot of evidence showing that air pollution decreased during the, the pandemic time because people weren't driving around, factories weren't running. And there's a nice or a, a very strong link between um, uh, air pollution and preterm birth rates. So that could be another reason. And then another thing to consider is decreased interventions. Because these moms are not being seen um, as readily by their healthcare practitioners, uh, maybe we're not getting in there and intervening. That goes back to that iatrogenic or medically indicated preterm birth that I talked about. And then kind of looking at the bad news story of the pandemic, um, things that may also may be increasing stillbirth or uh, causing negative impacts on moms 
is there's a lot of emotional and mental stress happening right now. There's fear and anxiety around the pandemic. Many people became unemployed. And of course, uh, lots of families out there that have school-aged children know that we all struggled through trying to homeschool on top of doing everything else involved with parenting and the stress of the pandemic. So there was a lot of added stress and emotion um, happening to moms. Uh, the other thing we considered was nutrition, and this can go either way. So those moms, um, maybe perhaps in more high income settings, maybe were around the house more, eating more, having a lot, a bit more nutrition than they were usually used to. But on the other side, usually in lower middle income settings, um, nutrition maybe became compromised. So access to safe and healthy food sources, if you can't leave, you can't go to the store, that's another consideration to um, take, on, take into the modeling. And then finally, the big thing that we're concerned about is that lack of access to maternity care. So pretty much every pregnant woman during the pandemic lost their consistent access to their care provider. Um, we've heard stories of some women only seeing their care provider one time face to face prior to giving birth. So this, of course, will have an impact on the quality of care that women received and maybe some things were missed. So with that in mind, we have built a protocol that will be capturing data from uh, collaborators uh, that look at these kind of elements, um, both on a regional and on an individual level scale. So regional, we would be looking at the area around where mom lives, be it in her city or her country. Um, so the OECD index is the economic index of that country. We'll look at how strict the lockdowns were uh, for people in different sites. We're going to consider maternity leave policies because that can provide us some answers as far as um, moms leaving the house in their pregnancy because some countries do provide prenatal or um, maternity leave. Uh, maternity care practices as far as what the minimum standard of care is. And then of course, COVID-19 rates. And I wanna be clear, we're not looking at COVID-19 infection in mothers, but we can control for high uh, rates of infection to see if that altered the preterm birth rate. And then on the individual level, we're going to be collecting information on maternal socioeconomic status, how many babies they've had, how old they are, their ethnicity, um, their own personal employment and maternity leave options, if they had pregnancy complications, if they themselves knew they were diagnosed with COVID-19, or if they had any other um, acute or chronic health concerns that would impact their pregnancy. So the objective of the IPOP study is to investigate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown or restrictions on perinatal outcomes worldwide and to identify the underlying mechanisms or reasons. And what we really want to do is translate this information uh, to practitioners and clinicians and policymakers uh, globally. And this will help to uh, maximize the evidence so that it's turned into practice quickly uh, and will have a good impact or a better impact on the pandemic as it continues and perhaps towards um, future pandemics as they come about and how we deal with them looking at uh, reducing uh, access to care or reducing complications related to uh, pandemic lockdown restrictions. And it's really something that we're focusing on to be globally collaborative um, because we want these questions to be meaningful across the nation. And sometimes they can't be answered when we're just looking at a single site. So the three aims from the study, we've, um, we're just starting to harness down on aim one is to describe trends and regional differences. So as I mentioned before, we kind of had confl conflicting information if the stillbirth rate and if the preterm birth rates have changed. So we first need to answer that question to see where they've changed, if they've changed and how they've changed. And then once we get that information, we'll move on to aim two to figure out um, the context and why. So again, this is gonna be looking at bigger data from um, birth records, um, population level data, but to look at if the changes during the lockdown were correlated with things like air quality or maternity care um, and how they, these um, changes modified uh, preterm birth rates or stillbirth rates. And then as we move forward with that, we're gonna move on to AIM-3, which will be a little bit more 
fine detail where we'll be collecting that individual data on mothers to answer the impact of maternal comorbid comorbidities or other illnesses or pregnancy complications, um, their own personal care patterns, and how their own socioeconomics can impact uh, their outcomes. So it is quite a long um, study as far as our timeline, but um, we're, we're moving forward quite effectively with AIM-1. So we've really been quite conscious to develop a very multidisciplinary team. We have uh, clinicians, neonatologists, and maternal fetal medicine specialists. We have people um, that specialize in statistics and epidemiology, so population health. We have people that specialize in uh, feminism and maternal rights. Um, and then some artificial intelligence uh, to help us with the modeling as well. We've really embraced a very open science or team science approach uh, to collaborating to ensure that we're inclusive of uh, researchers and clinicians from all over the world. And um, one of the upsides of the pandemic is it's made uh, remote collaboration very accessible for many. So we use Slack, Google Drive, Zoom to talk uh, to our collaborators all over the world. The biggest uh, constraint on us is the time zones, really. And then we've built some strategic partnerships um, with knowledge user groups, uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada, Born on Time, and then the International COVID Data Research Alliance, which is um, an alliance that is helping us manage our data on an international level because um, it's actually quite an undertaking to have a, a bunch of data coming in from countries all over the world to manage it safely um, and equitably. And then we're really focusing on integrating the knowledge that we um, have built uh, and translating that effectively. So we've done a lot of stakeholder engagement, we've done a lot of patient engagement, and we'll be moving forward with that throughout our study to ensure that the evidence we find is um, provided to people that will use it in a very timely manner. So we're really excited about this is our map um, as of November 6th. So as I mentioned, this uh, recruitment of collaborators started, started less than three months ago. And in that time, we've gotten over 100 collaborators uh, across over 42 countries. Uh, we have really nice representation from lower and middle income countries, but we're always looking for more. So if you are a researcher out there, or someone who has access to data from other countries, feel free to contact us. Um, and right now, the data that we'll be looking at will cover about 2.4 million births per year. Um, so we've developed a protocol, uh, taken a lot of time to look at consistent data collection and definitions, because when you're working on a global scale, uh, words are very important and have different meanings. So we, we have really taken a lot of effort to make sure that the words we're using, the terms we're using are consistent for everybody that we're working with. Um, administrative data collection takes a lot of effort as far as ensuring it's safe and the data are protected because countries don't like to give up their data to people that they don't know. Um, so we have to ensure that we have all our legalities in place. As I mentioned before, we've built us or we're collaborating to have this secure, secure digital research environment so that um, the data will be safe. And then uh, for the statistical experts out there, we're doing an interrupted time series analysis by region. Um, and then we're gonna meta-analyze. We're gonna take the data from all the different sites that contribute, so 42 countries right now, and we're gonna do one study on all of them to tell about the trends that are happening globally. I'm going to skip that and just talk about our governance structure um, and the people involved in the study. We are really, um, I've mentioned the leadership core. I want to acknowledge that we've um, taken um, very serious consideration of patient engagement and knowledge user engagement from the beginning. This is where Fabiana comes in uh, and her colleagues have been fantastic as far as informing um, the study. But what their input is going to be really meaningful for is telling us what mechanisms we should probably be exploring from their own personal experiences. And then uh, we have other experts in air quality, maternal stress, health systems and infections um, that are going to be informing what mechanisms or reasons for the preterm birth. And then we have an entire working group dedicated to low and middle income country uh, collaboration to ensure that we're being equitable, uh, that we're reducing barriers so that researchers from those countries and parent um, partners can 
access us and participate equitably in the project. So what do we hope to come from this study? Um, we hope to discover and understand potentially preventable causes of adverse perinatal outcomes that can impact, <clears throat> impact uh, preterm birth, low birth weight, stillbirth, and neonatal, neonatal mortality. We've been provided with a, a natural experiment essentially from the pandemic lockdown, and it could provide some better understanding of what causes adverse perinatal outcomes. And we're hoping that we can figure that out, some of that out. Uh, we hope to inform future research and maybe develop some interventions to improve perinatal health uh, beyond this pandemic, but also within this pandemic if uh, it continues uh, longer than the next year. Um, we hope to build research capacity. So some of the collaborations that we're building are going to move beyond this pandemic and um, we'll be able to look at perinatal health on a global perspective, hopefully in other contexts um, beyond the pandemic. And that's kind of um, something that's not really been done very well previously. So we're hoping that these partnerships can uh, help with that. Uh, we're hoping to develop robust guidelines for international perinatal outcome research. And then, as I mentioned, establish a sustainable and equitable global research platform. <clears throat> so um, uh, this draws us to the end of the study uh, or the presentation. So if you are interested in learning more about the IPOP study, I do invite you to visit our website. And if you are potentially interested in collaborating, we do have an intake form on this website that you can fill out and then we'll contact you with more information. Um, but I do want to thank um, Fabiana and the Canadian Preterm Premature Babies Foundation for inviting us to speak with you today. And I also want to acknowledge um, the Health Data Research UK who have provided us with foundational funding to start this project as we move along um, the timeline. Oh, Fabiani, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much for your presentation. That was, is absolutely great to see this collaboration happening around the world and really analyze what is happening. Uh, do we have any data available from Canada? What is happening right here? So unfortunately, the data in Canada is still anecdotal, but um, we do have it coming. Um, the thing when you're working with population level data is it's quite slow to be um, available to the researchers because they have to centralize it and make sure that the data are correct or collected correctly. So we're hoping to have that later this month or uh, early next month. But anecdotally, we've seen some variances across the country. Calgary definitely had the biggest drop in our NICU census uh, by far, but we did see some fluctuations across the country and in other places uh, such as Vancouver and apparently Montreal really didn't see too much uh, change. So it'll be nice to look at that data on a national level. So when we're going to look at this data from different countries, and I'm thinking about countries like Brazil, where there's so like the disparity of care is incredible. If you if you're born in the Amazon or in a big center like Sao Paulo or even Canada, if your baby is born in Ontario, in Toronto versus a, a baby who is born in Nunavut, are we going to analyze that data where the, the numbers dropped by area? Because then you can see, okay, because this area is more usually is more polluted than people who live in the north of Canada or people who live in the Amazon in Brazil. Are we going to be able to cross that information? We are, and that's the beauty of having such um, an international expertise. We've pulled people in that have expertise in air pollution and have expertise in socioeconomics uh, and rural health. So they'll be able to inform our uh, data analysis so that it, we can be sensitive to those potential influences. And I think that that analysis is going to give us a lot of information that we've never had before. Absolutely. So my next question to you is, you, when we are talking briefly before, you mentioned that Japan has this prenatal maternity leave. So parents stay home before they deliver the baby. Supposedly they are going to deliver a term baby. Uh, is this something that we are looking at that is a possibility that parents might need to rest during pregnancy? It's a great question. So Japan and some other countries do have um, a prenatal maternity leave. 
uh, where moms go off, I believe for the last six weeks of their pregnancy, and they have a substantially lower preterm birth rate than the global, uh, the background baseline. Um, I mean, that's, there's a lot of reasons why that could be, um, but this study is, that's something we're gonna be looking at because we essentially had a forced uh, prenatal maternity leave in a lot of settings. So potentially that could be it. And if we do see that that is potentially a factor, like I said, we've partnered with uh, government in Canada, the Public Health Agency of Canada, and that could be evidence that they're really interested in looking at for policy change. Absolutely. So when are we going to have some preliminary analysis of that data? Goodness, um, I hope early next year. Yeah, it's, uh, as I said, getting uh, data agreements from countries across the world to ensure that everybody is meeting a minimum or we're addressing a minimum requirement has been a learning experience, but hopefully we'll develop templates and make it a lot easier for researchers moving forward. Absolutely. So I want to thank you so much for your time today, for sharing this information with us. We are really looking forward to keep uh, keeping this collaboration going. And I will have to bring you back next year to give all the information and what is happening with that study. We'll have the big reveal. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Mary Lee Brockway. Thank you, Fabiana. Have a great day. Thank you.